So I get that a t- successful typing interview results in accurate identification of type, but are there any other markers, top five markers of a successful typing interview? Okay, that's a very interesting, creative and good question. <laughs> Great question. <laughs> What do you think, B? What is your number five? <laughs> My number five uh, is, um, I'm already thinking of number one, but I would say <laughs> number five is good follow-up questions and listening to the answers deeply. Not, yeah. not, not hearing what you think you hear, but really hearing what the person means. <laughs> right. I would say... To me, my number five is what you said about presence, Russ. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, being truly present and not only having your interview script in your head, being Mm -hmm. present to what the person is saying at that very moment and receptive. Together with that, on my number five, it's training yourself uh, to get rid of the confirmation bias. Mm -hmm. Like you, you want to see more of what you think you are already seeing. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that is a result of not being present uh, above all, I think. Sounds like you put two in that one. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Exactly like you do at times in our top fives, like cheating. Good point, good point. I cheat when I do. (laughs) Having a a draw, how do you call it? Uh, Yeah, a A double. A tie. A tie, yeah. (laughs) Um, I would say number four might be um, being really aware of your own biases. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, over the years, I would say my biases have shifted. They were different now than they were before. But one of the ones I've noticed recently is because so many people I end up doing interviews with end up being self-preservation fours (laughs) (laughs) because they're the types that like get mistyped by everyone and have the hardest time finding their type. And there's no descriptions of it very many places. Uh, Now I have to be careful of thinking everyone I see is a (laughs) self-preservation (laughs) four. Not surprising at all. I have to be careful. Like the other day I did a typing interview and I got to the end of it and I really, you know, uh, what I, I was hearing self-preservation four or seven, Mm -hmm. you know, and so I had to be careful inside myself of don't just emphasize the self-preservation four data, like really say the data that's also pointing to potentially seven. Mm -hmm. Um, So I had to real, I, I made sure that I, Made, sort of made the case for both since I was hearing a potential for both. <laughs> well, my number four is having a, a very good list of questions and follow-up <laughs> questions because, um, you know, there, there are th- some um, things that we attribute to some types that although they 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 are very descriptive of that type. They are not good questions to be posed to an interviewee. Yeah. Uh, for instance, if you ask someone about how much they seek for knowledge and information while you are testing if the person might be a type five, mm. um, th- you know that varies so much according to the education that the person got uh, in uh, has got during during earlier times in life, school, family of origin, and also you know who doesn't in today's world uh, yeah. go for more and more information of all sorts. So it's important to know how, either not to ask about that or know how to ask that. So it's mm. how to differentiate a five. It's uh, in one of the ways um, could be something like asking what, uh, how much, but also with what motivation, like mm. what is behind getting to all possible knowledge in the world and how you how do you deal with that what is the role of that in your life but also you know uh, having knowledge as an end and not a means Mm -hmm. not being so utilitarian about the knowledge that you get so you need to get to specifics so that you can differentiate between different people's uh, responses and i i would say are we at number three? Yeah, yes. <laughs> your third. Uh, if it's my third, I want to kind of say the same thing, but add a sort of a certain spin to it. 
asking good questions, like knowing what questions to ask and what questions don't help you. For instance, I see a lot of people asking uh, this question for type six, um, how loyal are you? And everybody says they're really loyal. Like I've hardly ever met anyone who didn't describe themselves as loyal, maybe every once in a while, you know, but so that's sort of a question that you're sort of wasting that question because mm -hmm. you're not going to get much good data from it. And mm -hmm. along with that, I would say, and this is very similar to what Uranio is saying is, is having a good ear, mm -hmm. like listening for how to interpret the data in the right way. For instance, um, I often sort of, one of my questions where I divide um, twos, threes, and fours from everyone else is the image question. You know, mm -hmm. how aware are you of having an image that you present to the world that other people see and evaluate you based on? And, and a little bit akin to that, or part of that is shape-shifting, you shape-shift. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing is twos and threes usually readily acknowledge the, the image thing, and they say it in a certain way. Fours, interestingly, kind of say it halfway. <laughs> they say they're aware of it, but again, they don't really want to shape shift, you know? <laughs> uh, and so it's like, it's like here, knowing how to listen for uh, what the different types uh, say and how they say it. These are very nuanced. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're now you're sorry you asked. This is going to go on way beyond five minutes. <laughs> and not to mention that this kind of question uh, gets us excited. Uh, yeah. So my now, now number. You're, you're learning why our podcasts are really long. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So my um, my number three is embrace the enneagram's complexity. Mm -hmm. Like know that. In order to come to a good result on on typing, you need to consider that it's not only about type; it's about the arrows, the levels mm -hmm. of awareness, the subtypes, uh, and also many other factors like the the background, uh, family, and professional and uh, even situations that the person might have a hidden agenda or might not trust you as an interviewer. Like when you were doing interviews as part of a corporate job and uh, the person has problems with the boss or, or with the HR department. Um, so you need, you need to take all that complexity into account. What is yeah. your number two? <laughs> <laughs> my number two is um it's kind of like the first few of our commandments it's combining humility with experience mm. um so there's no um there's no replacement for experience like practice a lot do a lot of interviews you know interview your friends and family mm. um once you start doing it a lot you start to hear the the language different types use and the way different types answer uh, and also being humble, like like not feeling too good about yourself if you're uh, doing a good job, but remembering that it's so easy to make a mistake. It's so easy to overvalue one piece of data and not hear something. Um, it's so easy to rush to judgment. Um, so to stay humble and balanced inside while also developing your skill over time with experience. I like that. And actually, my number two is also about humility because in order to type well you need to keep learning all the time about things that you didn't know before mm -hmm. and uh, the humility to have the client validate or not your feedback and your number one, number being. one. i think my number one is and i'm trying not to have it be this but i think it's <laughs> going to be i think it's going to be subtypes Mm -hmm. um, not only knowing that there are subtypes and using our approach, because I am biased that that's, I think, um, the best approach I've seen because it's so clear and definitive. But when you have 27 categories that are more nuanced and more specific, it's much easier to help someone find their type than if you just have nine. It's like using a blunt instrument. It's like having these more general kind of buckets instead of having much clearer, definitive, nuanced descriptions of a focus of attention and a set of patterns, um, some of which don't exist and don't get described by the nine. And so I know that, you know, I think over time I became a pretty good interviewer, but it wasn't until I learned this approach to the subtypes. I think it 
took my ability to type people to a whole new level because otherwise I might not see the social seven. I might not see uh, the one to one three. I might not see uh, certain types that uh, kind of look so much like other types unless you kind of know um, some of those really important subtype distinctions. I like that really. And, uh, but my number one is a mix of study hard mm. and do lots of typing interviews so mm. that you get experienced. Mm. So it's the hard work. Yeah. It's my number one because you won't get to a sophisticated level of typing unless you have studied uh, all the nine types and nuances subtype wise and in other ways like understanding that out there especially on the internet there there are um, stereotypes of all kinds uh, about each of the nine types mm -hmm. which are simply wrong and if you don't study that through a good source but study hard you also you also won't be able to compare two types you are in, in doubt uh, with. Um, and uh, the experience of having done many typing interviews is invaluable because you, you know how people answer uh, to each of your questions, which by the way, should be the same always so that uh, it favors your uh, comparison between different interviewees' uh, answers. Having the experience of having done that a lot gives you a, a better condition to do your next type in interview. Mm. So work hard uh, mm. if you want to do it well, mm. like rest. 